that's a very tough act to follow, I have to tell you. Um, so Emma wanted me to talk about telemonitoring uh, as the future of outpatient care and heart failure. Uh, I have no uh, relevant disclosures, but I think it's always important to start with a general comment that I am a uh, practitioner of heart failure. And as a result, although I try to be unbiased, the simple truth of the matter is I am uh, totally influenced by my day-to-day -day practice and by my experience, so I will try to share that with you. This is preaching to the choir, but I always think it's nice to start with a bit of a, a basic place. Heart failure is an epidemic. We know this. If we think about it uh, in Canadian terms, we know that about 1% of patients over the age of 65 will have heart failure, 4% over the age of 70, and the more you know, startling statistic in Canada is that uh, in a lifetime, one in five people, one in five Canadians will develop heart failure. The most common age with which it's diagnosed is in those who are over the age of 80. And we know that in Canada, there are half a million Canadians with heart failure and 50,000 new cases each year. Despite best medical therapy, and we're going to spend some time tomorrow talking about some of that during the cases, we also know that the one-year mortality after diagnosis remains incredibly high at about 25 to 40 percent, and the average life expectancy very low at 2.1 years. And I think the other really terrifying fact for us is that over the next 20 years, we expect the prevalence of heart failure to increase by 25 percent. So why do we need remote patient monitoring? Well, I think it's very fair to say that right now there is no country, even a wealthy country like Qatar, there is no country that can afford to treat heart failure, especially the growth of heart failure that is coming. And we know, in, if I use some US data, that it is the most common Medicare diagnosis related group. There are more Medicare dollars spent on the diagnosis of treatment and heart failure than any other diagnosis. All cause readmission rates are incredibly high. Uh, in the US, about 100,000 hospitalizations per year, averaging at least six days. In Canada, it's three to four billion dollars that we spend. In the US, it's 30 to 40 billion dollars that is spent. This is an incredible industry and an incredibly costly industry. And if we think about things on a global level, which is really what we're trying to talk about and talking about the inter-CHF and these other studies, we're really talking about the global impact of cardiovascular disease. And we know that uh, most of cardiovascular disease actually takes place in low and middle income country and we also know that there's going to be an incredible growth globally of cardiovascular disease and therefore of heart failure. And it's only going to get worse uh, because we do have an aging population. So that's a little terrifying when you start thinking about statistics that way. And so that's why I think telemonitoring is important. So what I want to do is start with some definitions so that everybody uh, understands the same language. When we talk about self-care, what that really means is that the it's the decision-making process patients use to maintain physiologic stability. So this includes their taking their medications, they're following their diet and their exercise recommendation, and that they themselves are actively aware of what they need to follow in terms of their symptoms shortness of breath, orthopnea, uh, swelling of the ankles. Self-management is an extension of that, and that is actually where the patient themselves are self-adjusting their treatment regimen. We can talk about structured telephone support, and we know that there have been meta-analysis that show that these may reduce hospitalizations. And then when we get into the issue of telemonitoring, or remote patient monitoring, as we tend to call it, this involves the transfer of some amount of physiologic data such as blood pressure, weight, ECG signals, oxygen saturations through technology, such as telephone, broadband, satellite, or wireless, into some sort of program that's actually going to monitor that and feed back some information, and I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, and then there can also be monitoring through implantable uh, devices, and I'm not going to address that category today. So we did a study looking at uh, self-care and quality of life in heart failure patients, and we wanted to try to understand really what we could do to improve self-care and what some of the barriers were. And what we found was that the major barriers to self-care for patients were that they had a lack of self-care knowledge. So they didn't really, despite the time that you spend with them, they actually really didn't understand what the process was that you were doing. They didn't really understand that that self-care knowledge could be uh, tracked to an actual perceived benefit. 
Uh, they did, had low self-efficacy, and for many of the patients, they had significant financial constraints that also limited their ability to follow uh, any of these plans. So what can we do as practitioners to try to improve self-care behavior? Well, this is one of my favorite statistics. So there are 6.8 billion people on this planet, and 5.1 of them own a cell phone. Uh, only 4.2 billion own a toothbrush. If you look at millennials, 96% of millennials own a cell phone, 93% of millennials own a toothbrush, and 90% of millennials uh, have deodorant. So, um, you know, you can think about that however you wish, but uh, it sort of gets the point across that this is a pervasive technology uh, in our planet. In the US, 85% of adults have cell phones, of which 53% are smartphones. One-fifth of smartphone owners will have some form of a health app. I'm not sure how many of you have a health app on your phone. I bet you if I asked, it's probably more women than men because that's usually what we find. And what is the number one app that people have on their phone? WhatsApp. Sorry? WhatsApp. Yeah, so it's usually something to do with either exercise or diet. Those are the commonest apps that people have. And uh, a lot of people will do step counters and Fitbits on their phone. Uh, etc. But these are the most common ones that we actually see now. So people are already using this technology. And in fact, one of the really exciting things when we think about our aging population is in fact the fastest growing smartphone market is like my mom and dad, right? So it's people over the age of 55 is the most rapidly growing uh, group to actually adopt uh, smartphone technology. Well, we were interested in this, so we looked at our own uh, uh, clinic and we thought, let's find out if our patients are actually comfortable with the idea of using mobile health technology. Uh, and what we actually found was that when we sat down and talked to them, patients were very interested in using this technology if they found it was going to be easy to use. So it had to be something they could just insert into their daily life. Uh, if they felt they could measure tangible benefits for it, if they were certain that despite this e-health innovation, that they would still have adequate patient-provider communication. So they don't want to use it to totally supplant the face time that they actually spend with their healthcare provider. Uh, from a clinician's perspective, we were pretty straightforward with our answer. We didn't want it to increase our clinical workload. So that was a pretty important thing, and we also had to be certain that the technology was actually going to be safe. So why use remote patient monitoring? Well, I think most of us have fully accepted that disease-modifying programs work. Uh, there's tons of data on this. And really, remote patient monitoring, in many respects, is just an extension of what a natural disease-modifying program is. We know that they can improve outcomes. They can reduce hospitalization. And the, the reason to get into remote patient monitoring is because it does allow us to use that intervention in the home environment. And in Canada, you know, uh, uh, Amr always likes to say to me that the entire size of Qatar is equivalent to the size of the greater Toronto area. So in Canada, we face incredible geographic issues. You know, today it's minus 30 back home. There is snow this high in most places, and most of my patients come from an average of a three-hour drive to get to my clinic. So really, that's not very feasible for many of the months of the year. So this allows us to take our expertise and put it to where the patient actually is. We also know that these interventions are going to be geared towards identifying and monitoring subclinical or early evidence of congestion to allow the intervention to occur in the home. And of course, the issue of preventing rehospitalizations is a little controversial, but that is generally the goal, reduce costs and improve quality of life. Uh, Ultimately, at the end of the day, all of us would also like to improve survival. So this is a fairly uh, traditional sort of way that you can look at the system. You have a patient who's at home, you know, reading the paper and relaxing. Somehow there's some wireless data or hemodynamic data that gets uh, uh, transmitted to a network. It uh, generates some form of an alert. There's a warm body that usually interprets that information. It either is a clinician or it may be a nurse or nurse practitioner, they communicate the treatment plan, there's a change in therapy, and this is sort of the ongoing cycle. And this is a very typical style of home monitoring program. 
And I think Lynn Warner Stevenson did a lovely job with this, really to try to help us better understand why sometimes home monitoring may not work as well as we'd like it. So obviously the most direct path to action is really what we're trying to do here. And that's where the patient does a measurement, looks at physiologic indicators, receives data very quickly with a recommended therapy plan, the therapy's implemented, and you have this iterative sort of tight circle of care. As you start to add layers in there uh, with mid-level people uh, who might then communicate with an MD and then there's more communication and then they go back and forth and then they try to get back to the patient, you end up with these much longer paths to action and that may really affect the efficacy uh, of the remote patient monitoring. And what does it offer compared to usual care? Well, really, usual care is sort of weight and symptoms. This may be weight symptoms and the addition of hemodynamics. Uh, you may have scheduled PRN visits where you do your labs, your uh, fancy echoes with your twist and strain. Sounds like a new dance. Um, and then you may have less frequent need for it if you actually include remote patient monitoring. Visits here are totally depend on how sick the patient is, and here again, the idea is to try to reduce some of the visits. Therapy here is empiric or reactive, and this is much more about trying to be proactive in how you manage the patients. So what is the evidence for remote patient monitoring? We're an evidence-driven culture, and there was a beautiful Cochrane review that was done in 2010 looking at a large number of studies uh, on remote monitoring or telemonitoring, what they were able to show was a reduction in all-cause mortality uh, in those who were undergoing monitoring. They also just showed uh, an effect on all-cause hospitalization, and they showed an effect on hospital admission specifically related to chronic heart failure. So, yay, positive Cochrane review, Here's the final conclusion. This is effective in reducing the risk of all-cause mortality. Early adopters get out there, adopt the technology. And then lo and behold, we had this post-Cochrane review, which added two large studies, the teleheart failure and the Tim heart failure. I'm going to leave the champion alone because that was uh, with invasive hemodynamics. But when you added the teleheart failure and the Tim heart failure, neither of these studies, which were huge studies, uh, in terms of numbers of patients, very well-powered studies. Neither of them showed benefit in terms of mortality, there was no benefit in terms of hospitalization, and there was no benefit in terms of hospitalization for heart failure. So just to focus on some of the other ones that have also been published since Cochrane, and just to summarize, no benefit, no benefit, no benefit, no benefit, an improved composite score, no benefit. So that's pretty depressing when you're starting to think about uh, trying to uh, develop this technology. And I want to drill down into Chaudhry's study because this really was the largest study of its kind to look at uh, telemonitoring in patients with heart failure. And what they showed, and I'm pointing to here, is that readmission for any cause, for death, no difference. Readmission for any reason, no difference. Mortality, no difference. And so overall, this study would have suggested to us that there's absolutely no point in investing in telemonitoring. So, you know, we have a very large program in e-health and innovation at our center with a large human factors uh, program. And what our feeling is on this is that the problem with randomized control trials in e-health and innovation is that an application is not a drug. Uh, outcomes are highly dependent on how you implement the study. They can take years to do properly, and as a result, the application is obsolete by the time you actually publish. They're quantitative, and they can tell us what, but they rarely tell us why. So if we come back to the comments from Chowdhury in this paper, they suggested that a telemonitoring strategy failed to provide a benefit over usual care in a setting optimized for its use. And this was what they used. So I think most of us would accept that this is obsolete technology. So there were many challenges with the way this study was actually designed. And what's really interesting is it's an extremely well-cited study, but if you actually look at the numbers, so 85.6% of patients in the telemonitoring group made at least one call, one call over a whole study. This is remote patient monitoring and they made one call. 90% uh, during the first week, so that was great, they started well. 
but it decreased to 55. So only half of the group by week 26 were actually reporting in. So the way we read that is that the loss to attrition rate is incredibly high. If you had done this with a drug trial, uh, first of all, I don't think it had been published in the New England Journal because people would have said the efficacy of your intervention is lousy because your attrition rate is incredibly high. So we believe the value of remote patient monitoring is self-evident. Uh, I mean, who actually can argue that the concept of having the ability to monitor a patient between scheduled interactions is not anything but beneficial to their management? Realizing this is another matter. So what we did is we wanted to try to make things a little bit more sexy, a little bit more 2015, and we developed a rule-based expert system uh, for our telemonitoring. And basically this was an iterative system where we created a rule set, we refined and verified it on feedback, we vetted and refined it further, does it need to be, and we just kept going through this loop until we actually landed on a rule set that we could actually use. And the rule set, and it is, I'm, I'm really oversimplifying this because we had a PNG PhD uh, and a number of other PNG people involved in this project. And it, is, it was incredible, the engineering behind this is phenomenal. Uh, and what we were able to do is for, for any patient, we would uh, provide individualized therapy by entering that patient's ranges and issues into our system and then follow this rule-based system. So if I come back to Lynn Warner Stevenson's diagram, what we were actually able to do is really address that side uh, of the whole equation. We developed the rule-based expert system, which was all computerized and Bluetooth enabled, and it automatically sent recommendations back. So it was this fast. That's how fast it went back to the patient. If there were alerts that were of concern, and all of this was set in the rule-based system when we established it for each individual patient, that alert went to the physician, uh, uh, also to their Bluetooth-enabled device, and if there was a very uh, concerning alert, not only would the patient get it directly from the rule-based system, but they would also get a follow-up phone call. But they didn't need to wait to know what to do because the, the inst uh, information was instantaneous. We did a uh, clinical trial of this. It was a, a really more of a pilot trial to actually uh, show what we were able to do. And this is just to give you an example of what, uh, what the patient would do. So every morning they got on the scale. The scale was Bluetooth enabled. Uh, the blood pressure cuff was Bluetooth enabled. All the patients were provided with a BlackBerry, so we're already obsolete. Uh, the symptoms were, uh, all the information was uploaded. Symptoms were really just yes, no. Uh, the information went directly into the, uh, the programming, and if there was uh, a serious alert, such as you fainted, or there was a very significant change in weight, blood pressure, or other symptoms, they would get a notification to call 911, and then other notifications would totally depend on what the patient actually put in. Uh, we also had uh, ECG monitoring as part of it as well, uh, and, and its system worked actually very well. So I gotta close that and back to here. And so this is, just gives you an idea. And again, that, you know, we thought we were pretty uh, with it at the time, but obviously we were, were now obsolete using this technology, but you can just give an idea of what patients would actually enter. And it was all Bluetooth enabled. So the patient just had to stand on the scale and the information automatically went into the system. So it was a small study, only 100 patients. Um, they, patients received daily reminders onto the phone if they actually uh, hadn't gotten onto the phone. And then the algorithm, of course, as I've mentioned, the alerts went to us as a cardiologist. So unlike Chowdhury's study, 70% of our patients completed 80% of their daily measurements. So that is a remarkable adherence over six months, and you can track it here, and you can see that we had just the smallest little blip initially, but really remained very much in range. So remarkable adherence uh, in terms of putting the measurements in. And from the patient's perspective, uh, all but two of the patients really landed on the same philosophy, which is that they felt more responsible because they were getting feedbacks, you know, your weight is up, cut your salt intake, You're, you know, this has happened, do this. Uh, and they, they felt much more like they were participating or being an active player in their care, which we believe is critical uh, when using remote patient monitoring. 
we had two patients who felt beyond a shadow of a doubt that we were back to George Orwell in 1984 and Big Brother was watching. And in fact, one of them said, yeah, no way am I doing this. Um, but, uh, but the vast majority of patients really uh, enjoyed it. What we were able to show was a reduction in BMP, an improvement in EF, an improvement in self-care, and a marked improvement in quality of life. And when we looked at patients, not patients who'd been in the clinic for years because they'd hopefully been well-educated, but patients who were relatively new to the clinic, we actually saw an, an even greater change in the BNP and a, and a better improvement in ejection fraction. We've moved from that technology onto a new platform, which is a smartphone base called Medley CHF. And the beauty of this technology for us is it's allowing us to use uh, multi-comorbid uh, diseases. So for patients who have COPD and CKD, it all comes in through the same system as well. Uh, the platform allows all the different uh, ca uh, caregivers in that patient's care to uh, log into the information from the family doctor, nephrologist, everybody, so everybody knows what everybody else is doing, as opposed to playing uh, push-pull and tug-of-war in terms of management. And so we believe it's, we're, we're making some progress. But I have to say, we're still looking at a rapidly evolving uh, system. And the idea behind it for us really is to facilitate self-care. So the priorities are empathy in design, and that's what our human factors group focuses on. We really believe that the patient and the family should have greater engagement, and, and they tell us that they want to. So we want to think about things as being more patient-centric and we think the implementation of these tools matters a great deal. When I talk about being obsolete, I don't think any of us would argue, and this is one of the major concerns with trying to do randomized controlled trials with these devices. So what's new? Uh, we have a, a large program, and one of the newest to, uh, tools we have is actually a tile that actually would go in the bathroom that is a Bluetooth-enabled tile, and when the patient stands to brush their teeth, and for the millennials that'll only be 93% of them, but when the patient stands to brush their teeth, it will automatically weigh them, and it will automatically transmit the information. Uh, we have sensors that are built into the home environment, including the one that terrifies people the most, which is the one attached to the fridge, uh, because people are very concerned about what you're being, you know, seen to eat, uh, etc. And then there's many more wearable devices that are coming, and, and there are a number that we actually are working with, a number of startup companies looking at novel Fitbit-based uh, devices that we can also Bluetooth enable and incorporate into our overall monitoring system, uh, and also uh, nice skin patches. Uh, one of our engineers is developing a very, very small, highly refined skin patch for continuous ECG monitoring uh, that patients can wear for weeks and weeks and weeks. So I think there's much to be done. I, I, you know, we are investing a great deal of effort and money in, into this area. But I think some of the biggest challenges that we still have is trying to define the right population to study. Because if you take a, a remote patient monitoring system that involves a lot of nurse to patient ratio and a, and a reasonable expense and your population at risk is very low risk, the likelihood is that your intervention is not going to be successful and it's going to be incredibly costly. So deciding on the right intervention is critical and, and it, I think it does depend on the study population. Whatever we design has to be scalable. So again, coming back to the billions of people that own cell phones, it needs to be affordable because it's not any good if what I develop is only useful in, in, in Toronto or in Canada. That's not the idea here. The idea here is to develop some form of monitoring system that is actually affordable on a global scale. And it needs to be manageable, which means that the ratio between looking at the device uh, to the individual monitoring, it has to be feasible. So for the 100 patient RCT that we did, uh, I was the person that managed all of the alerts. And I managed it in addition to a full-time job. And it was actually entirely uh, feasible for me to do so. The other issue is how do you actually do a typical heart failure randomized controlled trial or what we think of uh, in terms of drug trials in the face of rapidly changing technology? Uh, and what is the right endpoint to measure? One of the concerns about some of these technologies is that they may actually increase clinic visits and increase eMERGE visits 
And that might actually be appropriate because you may actually be finding out that your patient is getting into deep trouble and you want to actually see them uh, to intervene sooner. And do we actually need to do a mortality-driven trial or are we really looking more at feasibility of this technology? From a North American perspective, there's a great deal of concern about professional liability when you start to make decisions based on uh, these types of remote patient monitoring. And, and of course, we do like to get paid, so there's some concern about how the reimbursement structure uh, will work. But I do think that the future is in remote patient monitoring, and I think it is in smartphone technology because it is pervasive globally. And if we want to attack things globally, that is the best way for us to do it. Thank you. And I, too, am happy to entertain any questions. Any questions? Yes. How do you, you establish the quality of life? What are the outcomes in the world? I'm sorry? Why did you fly? Yeah, so we used the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure Quality of Life, and it was significantly improved in those patients, the 50 that were randomized. Uh, to the remote patient uh, monitoring in both components. So not just overall, but actually in both components. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much.